Good morning. Today's a special day at St. John's as we get to celebrate our high school graduates today. And for our message today, what we're talking about is this idea of what are we known for. I remember back in high school, if it's been a while for you, generally they do those most likely to succeed, most likely to do this, most athletic. Everyone kind of gets this different label a lot of times in high school. But today we're going to talk about what is our label overall? Like as Christians, how should people know us? And hopefully by the end of the day, you're going to see that there's a repeated message over and over and over again. And that message is ultimately we should be known through love through the love that we have and that love that we have to share with others. So, welcome once again to worship. We'll start this morning by sharing the peace with one another. If you want to do that by shaking hands, hugging, high-fiving, whatever you're comfortable with, then we will sing our opening hymn. And you can be seated for our opening hymn.
please rise. We make our beginning today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We join together in the call to worship based on Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works. And I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. Now we go to God, confessing our sins together. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Something that all of us are known for is our sin. We are sinful and we fall short of the glory of God. But another title we also hold is saints. Because God no longer holds that sin against us. We have been separated from that sin, Scripture says, as far as the east is from the west. So hear that reminder this morning. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Please be seated as we respond with our hymn of praise, They'll Know We're Christians by Our Love.
15, 4 through 13. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there are knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, when it is, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put ways of childhood behind me. For now we only see a reflection as in, as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these, are th- and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now we rise to hear the gospel reading. Our gospel reading today is from John 13, and it's verses 31 to 38. Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. My children, I will, not be, I will only be with you a little while longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. You must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, Will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You can have a seat at this time. We'd like to invite all the kids up for the children's message. Today, for my children's message, I wanted to talk about something that you guys see every Sunday and maybe we don't talk about very much, right? So we're going to talk about today, so we're going to talk about this picture. I moved the cross out of the way so we could see it really good. This picture right up here, this beautiful picture in glass. Anyone know, who is that guy? Who is that guy up there? Owen. Moses. Yes, all of you guys know. You're like, it's Moses, Mr. Josh. Of course. Now, There's something about this picture that I want to talk about. So Moses is holding the Ten Commandments, right? So, but the numbering kind of seems a little funny on those commandments. On one side we have one, two, three, and on the other side we have four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That seems a little weird. Anyone know why they're like that? Why is that one side one through three and the other side four through ten? Well, I'm going to tell you guys. So the first three commandments are all about God and loving God. The commandments 4 through 10 are all about loving each other. So which word did I use that's the same in both? What word is it? What word is it, Lucas? Love. Exactly. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We are to love God and love other people. Now my question is, how do we show that we love other people? What things do we do if we love somebody? What do we do? What things do we do? What do we do, Aiden? Listen to them. That's a great one. What else do we do, Madeline? Don't lie. Don't lie. Yes, we're going through the commandments, I think. What else? You play with them. You spend time with them. What else, Nora? Give them hugs. That's the one I was waiting for. I figured someone would say that. Yeah, we show things. We spend time with them. We hug them. We maybe give them kisses. We show them that we 
love them. Which, this is what I wanted to show for the other picture. So, can we keep all the commandments, every rule out there, can we keep them all or do we break them? We break them. We can't keep them all. There's a lot of them. There's ten. They're hard to remember. But here's what happened. We have this other picture up here. And I'm guessing all of you guys know who this is. Who's that up there? Jesus, exactly. Because we couldn't keep all the commandments, Jesus came to the world, died on the cross for all our sins because he loves us. Now look at Jesus. If he's doing this, he's got his arms out. If someone does this to you, what do you think they, they want? A hug. Exactly. That's what I think about Jesus because we can love other people because you know what? Jesus loved us. And that's why I love the front of our church when we look up there. We see Jesus after he came back. He has holes in his hands, but his arms are still out because he loves us. And that one too, it's reaching out. He's like, I'm ready. I'm ready for a big hug because God loves us that much. Right? So let's pray. Let's put our hands together. And we're going to thank God for loving us. We're going to ask him to help us love others because sometimes it can be hard to love everybody. So let's pray. Good morning, God. Thank you for how much you love all of us. Help us to love everyone else. In your name, we pray. Amen. Well, thank you guys for coming up. You knew all the answers. Thank you guys so much today. Good work. All right, as the kids are heading back to their pews, we will sing our sermon hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. This morning, as we look into the life of Peter, help us, God, continue to reflect on love. Ask that question, how are we known and how can we be known? How can people help see what we're doing and not see us, but see you working through us? Lord, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, a lot of times in life, there are big moments that are predictable. We expect them. These are kind of those big events that you mark on the calendar. In a few weeks or a week and a half, our graduates will have a big event, graduation. But maybe it's a wedding, maybe it's an anniversary, maybe it's starting a new job, having your first child. These are those big calendar events that we expect to be a big deal. There are, however, also big moments in our life that just kind of show up 
unexpectedly. They get dropped in our lap, and they're a complete surprise. And when they're happening, we don't always realize how big of an effect they have on us. Now, I had one of these moments happen to me when I was in eighth grade. So during my eighth grade year, I made a very big decision, what I would consider for an eighth grade student. I decided to not play a season of basketball. Now, I've talked about sports a lot in my sermons, so you might say, whoa, something is wrong with Vicar Josh. What possibly happened? Well, they had this thing called the eighth grade play, and I thought it'd be really cool to be a part of it. So I decided I'm not going to do one of my basketball seasons. I'm going to be in this play. Now, I came into practices and auditions very confident. I assumed for sure I would receive a major role in this play, and I would become a star. And the play we were doing was Beauty and the Beast. Now, I didn't think I really maybe had the attitude to be the beast, but I figured, well, I'll at least be a prince, a party guest, certainly a major role. So the day came, we did the auditions, and I felt that, I felt I nailed it, honestly. I I figured one of those big roles was coming to me, and, and this would be a big deal. So then the cast list was released. Now, if you've ever been part of a play, generally, the cast list goes from the most important person with the most lines all the way down to the least important person with the least amount of lines. So I started scanning. I didn't see my name on the top, a little weird, didn't see my name towards the middle, kept scanning all the way until I got to the very, very bottom where I finally found my name, Josh Hoffman Butler. Now, I was confused for multiple reasons. First, I didn't really understand why they didn't see my immense acting talent in the eighth grade. The other reason I was confused is I'd read through the whole script a couple times and I never saw the role of the butler. I'm like, what? I never, there was maids, there was never a butler. Well, come to find out what they did is they had added the role because I was interested in the play. They took lines from other people and gave me two lines. So basically, my eighth grade play was going to amount to a pity role of playing the butler. Now, I thought about quitting. I wanted to quit. Honestly, this is practice every day after school, but my parents didn't raise me that way. If you're going to start something, you're going to do it. You are going to finish it. So I would play the butler. So we went through months of practices, missed the whole basketball season, which that was the one season we actually won a lot of games. Maybe I was the problem. But get all the way through, and it's finally the night of our public performance. So our auditorium is packed. There's not a seat to be had. It's really super hot. It's uncomfortable. There is no chairs available. There's hundreds of people there. And I'm sitting there in my tux in the backstage, sulking. Really? the butler. This is what I have become. This is all I am worth. So the director brought us all in. Mrs. Meadows, I'll never forget her face. She brings all of us in and she says, this is going to be a night all of you kids remember for the rest of your life. I looked at the maids next to me and I said, no one is going to remember this dumb play tomorrow. Well, you can kind of guess if I'm telling this in a sermon that I was very, very wrong. So during the first scene of the play, I had no lines, okay? I just had to go from the left side of the stage all the way to the right side of the stage, clean something with my little cleaning rag on this side, and go all the way to the other side. So I was walking along the back of the stage, and our stage was raised up four feet off the ground, and there was a humongous castle backdrop, all right? It was awesome. So I'm walking along the back, and there's a table, and one of the chairs was pushed out just a little bit further than it was in all our practices. So my left foot was fine, my right foot ended up being totally not fine. Down I went, completely disappearing from sight. The curtain waves quickly, and I'm gone. So I quickly get back up. I straighten my tux out, straighten my little cleaning rag, and finish my scene, wondering, ah, did did anyone notice that? So I go backstage, and everyone's freaking out. People have definitely noticed, and they were worried. One of our princesses had been kind of sick during the day. She wasn't feeling good. It was really hot, and they were like, did she fall off the stage? I said, I don't know, but I think she's okay. I was not fessing up to it at this point. Well, obviously, everyone noticed it, and... The next day, I got to relive the moment over and over and over again in class because we had to watch the play. Now, this is back in the VHS days, so you had to hit rewind manually. So we would start the first scene, we'd watch Josh fall off, then we'd rewind, and we'd watch it again. Now, their VHS player was really fancy. It had a slow-mo feature. So they'd play it, they'd Josh gone, get back up. Josh gone, back up. Over and over and over again. So now we fast forward a few years. I'm graduating 
high school, and the lovely high school yearbook is going around. You know what a whole bunch of people wrote in my high school yearbook? Hey, Josh, do you remember when you fell off the, eighth, the, the, the stage in the eighth grade play? Yes, of course I remember it. This is all you guys have talked about years later. No one even remembers what the play was. They just remember for me falling off the stage. That's what I was known for, the kid who fell off the stage. See, this is the tricky thing. What we're going to talk about today is how do people remember us? Because we don't get to control how other people remember us. There were many other things that I would have certainly picked to be remembered for. A good basketball player, that would have been fine. The kid who liked Jesus would have even been better. Maybe even the guy who didn't know the notes but could still play a pretty mean smoke on the water for band. That would have been great. Or maybe the kid who could have gotten straight A's if he just tried a little bit harder. But all those would have been great. But instead, I was remembered for falling. Now, while we can't control how people remember us, we can control what people continue to see as we move forward in life. See, our reputation is much more than just one event. Our reputation is a collection of interactions we have with other people. Now, to explore that today, we're going to look at the biblical story of Peter. Now, Peter is so interesting because there's so many stories. If, you, if I just say, think about Peter, most of you are probably thinking about a different story about him. He shows up a lot in the Bible. He's always the disciple who seems to be raising his hand and speaking up. So I feel like we really, when we read the scriptures, we feel like we know Peter. So as you're going through these today, I'm going to show you some different Peters, and I want you to think about which one is the Peter maybe you relate over that first story you thought of for Peter. So maybe the Peter you know is the trusting Peter. So this is the story in the Bible. It's the middle of the night. All the disciples are in a boat, and Jesus is not with them. He stayed there to pray, and remember, most of these guys are fishermen, but there's some rough waves. It's really windy. They're all the way on the other side of the lake, and all of a sudden they see a man walking towards them. Now they all freak out. They've seen Jesus' miracles, they've seen those things, but they think it is a ghost. But they're terrified. So all the disciples are here in the boat. Many of them, as I said, they're fishermen. They know what they're doing, but only one of them speaks up. It's Peter. He says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come out on the water to you. So Jesus tells him to come, and Peter gets out of the boat and walks on the water himself. Now if you're a fisherman, you, you know, like, what happens if anything goes off the side of the boat? It sinks. And here's Peter. Everything in his mind has to tell him, I'm going to sink. But he looks at Jesus, he puts his foot over the boat, and he gets to walk on water. In that moment, Peter trusted Jesus. But maybe the Peter you remember isn't the walking on water, Peter. Maybe the Peter you remember is the proclaiming Peter. Now, Jesus had been doing ministry for some time. The word had spread about who this was, and people were just sharing all these amazing stories about what Jesus was doing. So Jesus asked his disciples quite simply, who are people saying the Son of Man is? So some of the disciples say, okay, John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Others Jeremiah. Others another prophet. So then Jesus redirects their question. He says, wait, wait, wait. Who do you? You guys have been with you. Who do you say that I am? And of course, who speaks up? It's our friend Peter again. He answers the question. He responds, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He got the answer right. God had revealed to Peter who Jesus was, and he proclaimed it. He told others. He had that bold proclamation of faith in that moment. But again, it's just a tiny slice of Peter. Maybe the Peter you remember is the dedicated Peter. See, this is what we saw in our scripture reading from today. So we read from John. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and we will glorify him at once. Now Jesus is speaking to these disciples, and this part Peter really hears. My children, I will be with you only a little while longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now. Where I'm going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. You must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Again, as I asked the kids in the children's message, what word shows up a lot? Love, 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 love. But here's what Simon Peter asks. Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. 
See, I love this scripture about Peter because I feel like it shows his heart. Jesus is telling him, hey, I'm going to go soon. And Peter's like, hey, what? I want to go where you're going. I care about you, God. I, you, I'm a follower. I'm a follower of you. I'm your disciple. Wherever you're heading, that's where I'm going to go. But then Jesus gives a command. It seems like a simple one. He says, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. In this moment, Jesus speaks about how the disciples and us should be known. People should know them because of the love they share with other people. And yet in the next line, we see what Peter picks up from this whole exchange with all those times of love mentioned. He says, wait, excuse me, why can't we follow you? See, Peter's whole life has been oriented to following Jesus, learning everything Jesus does and wanting to do it himself. Jesus says he's going to leave, and Peter stops listening. He completely misses the command about love. Instead, he's focusing on following, even to laying down his own life. But we know Peter's story. We say there's dedicated Peter. There's also a limit to his dedication. And we find that out when we read just one verse further in verse 38. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. See, Peter's also known as the disciple who denied Jesus. Denying Peter. And of course, that's exactly what happens next. So after Jesus' arrest, Peter's in the courtyard. Now, Peter stands far enough away that he hopes nobody notices him, but close enough that he wants to see what's going on. But apparently he wasn't far enough away because multiple people go to him and say, hey, are, are you, you're one of his disciples. You sound like him. I've seen you with him. You must be one of his disciples. And three times Peter says, I'm, I'm not. I don't know that man. I don't know Jesus. Stop asking me. This is how Peter could be remembered. Denying Peter. He had broken that trust. That trust that he used when he walked on the water was no longer present. But this isn't the end of Peter's story. Later in the Gospel of John, we see a resurrected Jesus ask Peter something three times. Peter, do you love me? It's almost like that lesson that Jesus was trying to teach earlier to the disciples, and Peter, he's going back to it. He's saying, you remember that command to love one another? That's what I'm talking about. Peter responds three times now again, yes, Lord, I love you. Jesus tells Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. Jesus wants Peter to show love for others by helping them. If he really loves God, then love needs to flow from what he does. See, putting all these stories together of Peter makes his story so much more dynamic. It keeps moving. It keeps evolving. It keeps changing. I think as the reader, we just kind of follow along, and I think we see ourselves in so many different places in Peter's life. He isn't just the guy who walked on water. He isn't just the guy who proclaimed Jesus or the guy who denies Jesus. He's all that and so much more. The same is true for all of us. We are all way more than just one singular event in our lives. Sure, I am the kid who fell off the stage, but I'm also the kid who got back up and finished his scenes and nailed those two lines later in the play. And as long as we still have breath in our lungs we also have the power to continue to be part of God's story. See, that's what Peter did, and that's what we aspire to do. If there's any reputation we want, we should want that reputation to center on love. If you're going to leave someone with anything, leave them with love. Show them Jesus, not us. We're going to keep making mistakes, and not just in our words, but also in our actions. See, this is what I believe Jesus is trying to tell Peter in John 13 and what Paul articulates so well in Corinthians. If our words, if they're just words and they're not actions, it's like a clanging cymbal, a resounding gong. The noise goes out, it catches attention, but it doesn't hold. It doesn't stick. Instead, we want our actions to speak for us. This is what Jesus did on the cross Jesus' words were not enough, but it was also his sacrifice. That's the promise that the gospel brings all of us. We receive total and absolute forgiveness for any mistake, anything we have done. Whatever our reputation might be, whatever stages or things we might fall off of in life, we 
are forgiven. And we respond to this, this love and forgiveness, by doing the same to others, by loving and forgiving them. And this is what Peter went on to do. He went on to live into the nickname that Jesus himself gave him, the rock that the church was built upon. See, the amazing thing about God's church is that it's still being built today. Not by Peter, not by Paul, or any of the other amazing apostles and what they've done. The church is being built by the Holy Spirit through us, through every one of us. So something I want you to remember about yourself, maybe not a way you've ever seen yourself, is I want you to remember yourself as a builder. Now, even if you've never swung a hammer, even if you've never even installed batteries or built a thing in your life, you are a builder because you are a dynamic part of God's creation and a part of his kingdom. God has given you specific gifts that you are meant to build his kingdom and spread his word. And part of that gift is our experiences. See, as I look back on that day that's getting longer and longer away, that eighth grade play, I've realized that God was doing some work in me. That event ended up being a rock that God was helping build that one day I wouldn't be really afraid of standing in front of a whole big crowd of people professing God because I had already fallen off a stage and completely embarrassed myself. God is going to continue to work through all of us and our stories the same. And like Peter, there's going to be times that we doubt. There's going to be times that we deny. But in those times, we work to cling to what God has promised us in the Bible. Those promises are not just empty words, but those promises are Christ's sacrifice and death for us, all out of love. So we joyfully get to continue to be part of God's work. We work so that other people can see Christ in us. We show this best by continuing to show love for one another. Because as God told Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. If we love God, we continue to show love for one another. Amen. Now we rise. We get to profess our belief in that God that is love. We love because he loved us first in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Uh, we will now go to God in prayer. After each petition, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, your response will be, hear our prayer. Let us pray. God, this morning we just thank you. We refocus ourselves and think about how do we continue to show love? Uh, there's a lot of hate. There's a lot of jealousy. There's a lot of negative things that exist and will continue to exist in this world. But God, we also know that you provided the ultimate sacrifice for all of us. So help us work at it. Loving others can be really difficult. Forgiving others can even be more difficult sometimes, God. But help us continue to phrase that all in the way of seeing what you've done for us. You continue to forgive everything we do wrong. You continue to love us in spite of anything that has happened in our lives. Help us to try to show that grace and love to one another. Lord, in your mercy. And God, this morning as we celebrate our graduates, I ask that you continue to be with them. You continue to remind them that wherever they go in life, that you go with them. Whatever their reputations are here in, in high school, if it's not something that they're proud of or happy about, God, we know that you are continuing to work through them. Remind them that, especially this morning, that where they go, you will go to. Lord, in your mercy. God, also be with all those who are sick and are suffering. We ask that you... Uh, especially we bring before you today Lowell Coles, Ryan Rutledge, Eugene Shrupp, Alfred Schmeckpepper, Shar Buckentine, Gary Radke, Lorena Pauly, Verona Herman, Bruce Powell, Joe Sherber, Cindy Beck, John Prochnow, and Randy Feldman. God, you know the needs of each one of these people. Help them see 
love from others. Help others share love with them to continue to encourage them in whatever illnesses they're having or emotional problems or recoveries. Uh, God, please remember each of these people and continue to strengthen them. Lord, in your mercy. And God, also be with our farmers. They're in the fields planting and we had some crazy weather this week with hail, with lots of rain. Help, continue to help them see the plan and how you are with them through that. Um, there's not many people I've met or who have met that have deeper faith sometimes than farmers. Continue to keep their faith strong in you. Lord, in your mercy. God, also view this today as we celebrate, as we celebrate the birth of Ruth Mae Williams, um, proud parents Fred and Amanda, and big brother Trey on May 7th, and also today in the late service as we celebrate the baptism of Asher William Ernst, son of Adam and Brittany. Just continue to be with these families, help them celebrate these big events that are going on in their lives, and just bless them with your presence. Help them remember, God, the deep love that you have for them. Lord, in your mercy. And God, also be with the family of Milton Volrath, father of Steve, who passed away this last week. Uh, continue to remind Steve and their whole family, God, in those dark, deep, uh, difficult moments that you are with them, that you grieve alongside of us, God, and that you ultimately love us, and remind them of that sure and certain hope of salvation through Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. And finally, God, we join together in the perfect prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You can please have a seat. So, um, one thing we're bringing back um, is our offering. So we're not doing our traditional passing of the plate, uh, but we are doing is we're still encouraging everyone to use the boxes, and then at a point in the church service, we will have those boxes brought forward. So for today, we've also made, Pastor Josh, with the help of Andy Cook, made a video just to talk about giving. There are so many different ways you can give here at St. John's, and every once in a while it's good to have that reset of exactly what is that. So we're going to show you this video, and at the end of the video, I'll invite the ushers forward uh, to be able to present the offering. gonna get well pastor josh there's so many choices i'm not exactly sure you know you think there's a lot of choices at the dollar store there's actually a lot of choices with how you can give your dollar to the ministry of saint john's here let me show you so andy what are, what are you waiting for well i was waiting for the plate to be passed so i could give my offering well actually Right now, we're not passing the plate. We have offering boxes. Here, let me show you. So what if I don't have envelopes? Is there another option? Actually, we offer several ways that you can give electronically. Here, let me show you. What? We're at the bank. What are we doing here? One of the ways that you can give is through an EFT form. EFT? What's that? EFT stands for Electronic Fund Transfer. It's an automatic bill pay where you can designate how much you want to give and how frequently you want to give. And it goes directly from your bank account to the church's account. Well, that sounds easy. So I can just go to the bank teller and they'll help me set it up? Yep, you can just talk to your local bank teller or just go to your online banking portal and they'll set it up for you. And you'll like this, Andy. It's free. Free? Well, I like free. What other giving options are there, Pastor Josh? For the next one, you can give anywhere. One more way that you can give to the church is using our online giving program called Breeze. In fact, there's a QR code on the back of every bulletin. A QR code? Huh, that's what that is. How do I use that? Well, just pull out your phone, 
put it in picture mode, snap a picture, and it'll take you directly to our online giving page. Wow, that was a breeze. Uh, what do I do now? Well, then you just fill out how much you want to give and the method by which you want to give, whether it's credit card or debit card. Well, let's do credit. You can choose to give with a credit card, but there is a 3% fee which is assessed. But don't worry, the church will cover that cost. I'm not sure I like the sound of that necessarily. Um, kind of want to maximize my giving to the church. What would be another option that I could do? Well, if you use your debit card, hmm. there's only a 1% fee, which the church will also cover. And who could set, help me set this up if I'm not computer savvy? Well, if you're uncomfortable setting it up yourself, you can always stop in our church office and talk to Stacy, our office manager. She'd be happy to help you set it up. So Andy, what are you gonna choose? Well, that's a lot of options. You know, it, it really is a lot of options, but remember, you can't go wrong. We give back to God because he first gave his son Jesus to us. Well, I think I know, after thinking through these options, Pastor Josh, I think I know what I'm going to choose. What are you going to choose? I'm going to choose a hundred grand. What a fantastic choice. Pastor Josh, would you like to share with me? You know, I would <laughs> love to share with you. And speaking of sharing, just a quick shout out to all of you for sharing a portion of your income with the ministry at St. John's, whether it's a hundred grand or not. Thank you for helping us to learn God's word, love like family, lead as we're able, and live for Jesus. What option will you choose? Let's pray. God, we thank you just for all the blessings that you continue to bestow upon St. John's Church and School. Continue just to move the ministry forward. Help us continue to share that love as we talked about today. It's all about being able to love each other and just show God what you have done for all of us. So thank you for the blessing in this, God, and continue to just make it an offering that continues to spread your news and your gospel to the world. In your name we pray. Amen. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Amen. So, I'm going to do our announcements now. We don't really have too many things for my knowledge coming up. We're wrapping up school in the next couple of weeks, so please do keep these graduates in your prayers as they finish out their times. You notice the different high schools. We have uh, Glencoe represented. We have Mayor. We have Central. And just always a blessing. So let's give a round of applause just to support our graduates. So I will process out with them. They'll be out there in the fellowship area. We have cookie and coffee hour, so stick around to visit with that. Visit also with our graduates. We will close with our closing hymn, Lord, whose love through humble service.